Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my Unsolved Mystery series. Or if you're new here, hi, welcome. Please make sure you click that subscribe button if you want to see more. Today I've got something a little bit different for you. We're going to be talking about the case of Mary Reesa, whose death was put down by the public as a case of spontaneous human combustion. But this has been a hot topic of debate for many decades now. This is a case where spontaneous human combustion is the most rogue of theories. It's what most people says makes the most sense here, but the FBI actually disagree. What really happened to Mary? This is a question that's been pondered at length over the last seven decades, but nothing has ever provided a solid answer. You might have also referred Mary's case referred to in the past as the Cinder Woman case, but in my opinion, victims should always be referred to by their name, Mary Risa. But before I tell you about Mary's story, I want to thank Virgin TV for sponsoring us today, the documentary streaming service. Now I'm sure over the years you've all already heard why I love Magellan TV so much, so instead of just listing all the reasons, I'm just going to jump straight in and tell you about a documentary that I watch that's perfect for October and the spooky season, Superstitious Minds. Now did I click on this documentary purely because the black cat on the thumbnail looks exactly like my cat Crumble? Absolutely. Did I have any regrets? Not a single one, I enjoyed this documentary so much. This documentary explores a wide variety of different superstitions in today's society, where they come from and how are so many people willing to believe them. You have interviews with skeptics and people who are full believers, you even have interviews with experts in superstition. And as somebody who doesn't consider herself to be very superstitious, I mean I literally own a black cat, I was very surprised to find out through this that there are actually some trains of thought that I do follow without really even realising it. Like, given the choice, I'll never choose to walk over three drains. Why? I couldn't tell you. Just seems like it's not really worth taking the risk. But then again, I will happily book flights for Friday the 13th because they're cheaper. Why do I care about some superstitions and not others? That is what this documentary explores. It's a really interesting study into the human mind. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch Superstitious Minds, then you can click on the link in the description box down below to claim your one month free trial. They have more true crime and history and science documentaries than you could dream of. So this case takes us back to the 2nd of July 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida, USA. Mary Hardy Risa was just 67 years old when that morning her landlady and neighbour Pansy Carpenter came to Mary's front door to deliver a telegram that Western Union had brought to her house. But once arriving at Mary's home, Pansy quickly found that her doorknob was just too hot to touch. Knowing the signs of a potential house fire, she immediately called the authorities. Pansy would also later report that around 5am that morning she had heard a dull thud and the shutting of a door. She looked around outside but didn't see anything so started to head back to bed but on the way she thought she could smell smoke in her own home. She assumed it was an overheating water pump in the garage so she turned it off and went back to bed not thinking anything more of it. But this made a lot more sense now she thought, there was clearly a fire in Mary's apartment. Only when the authorities gained access to the home, nothing much made sense at all. Firefighters broke in to find a soot and smoke filled apartment but there was no actual fire. Nor was there any sign of Mary herself, only a black pile of ashes. Now the FBI files for this case are actually publicly available online, of course I'll leave the link down below in my sources. And here is what the official report to John Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI at the time, has to say. The body of Mrs. Risa was partially cremated, with the exception of the left foot which was burned completely in two, about four inches above the ankle. Shoe was had been worn on foot by the deceased was still intact. The chair in which she had been sitting was completely burned away, leaving just the springs. A small end table was completely burned with the exception of two legs. The carpet was burned in an area of approximately three feet. The apartment showed signs of extreme heat on the ceilings, walls approximately four foot from the floor. Plastic light switches had melted but floor plugs were unharmed. An electric clock stopped at 4.20am. Interestingly, a number of plastic items in the vicinity of the fire had been softened by the heat but hadn't melted. And plastic doesn't have a particularly high melting point, so this was really interesting to investigators. So there had quite clearly been some kind of fire that had put itself out before it burned down the whole apartment. 
The signs of extreme heat that I mentioned from the quote previously seems to refer to a layer of soot in a ring around the upper part of the walls. You know when you kind of leave a candle burning for too long, perhaps a bit too close to a shelf or something above it, and a burnt ring forms above? It was that, but on the walls and the ceiling of this apartment. And also, although it's not mentioned in the original list of evidence found at the scene, later documents in the file reference a shrunken skull being found at the scene as well. Now, from what I can gather, multiple newspaper and magazine articles from this time reference this shrunken skull being found, however, none of the official documents mention it as far as I can see. The only time it's mentioned in the file is in a letter sent to investigators by an anonymous person who repeatedly references magazine articles they've read about Mary's case. This shrunken skull remains something I couldn't find a full answer on. It may or may not have existed. Another document sent to the FBI director by investigators says that on the 7th of July they were forwarding a number of exhibits, further evidence found at the scene. This investigation did move pretty fast, this was just five days after the scene was found. They sent forward things like glass fragments found in the ashes, six small objects they thought to be teeth, particles of bone, and some sources refer to these as being backbones or spinal vertebrae, but I'm not entirely sure. They sent her whole foot, material from the chair and her nightgown, charred bits of furniture, and interestingly, an unburned section of the rug which was heavily soaked with a greasy substance. These items were to be forensically examined for a number of things. They wanted to see if the glass contained a flammable substance, particularly anything that would cause a fire of such extreme heat. They wanted to see if the teeth were indeed teeth, and if so, how hot does a fire have to burn to destroy teeth? It is a very well-known fact that a lot of the times after car and house fires, victims are identified via their teeth as they're all that remains. They obviously also wanted to examine all evidence for any foreign substance that might have started the fire, acid or kerosene or anything similar. Again, taken verbatim from the report, it reads, We also request any information or theories that could explain how a human body could be so destroyed and the fire confined to such a small area, and so little damage done to the structure of the building and the furniture in the room, not even scorched or damaged by smoke. Because that is the main question here, how could a fire have destroyed seemingly Mary's body and Mary's body only? They didn't have confirmation that the ashes were Mary's body at this point, but they could figure out that it probably was. It was a mystery then, and somewhat remains a mystery now. Mary was last seen alive by her son, Richard Reeser, the night beforehand, so on Sunday the 1st of July 1951. He reported that his mother was depressed because she wanted to travel north back to Pennsylvania for the summer and she didn't think she was going to be able to. She hated Florida in the summer, it was way too hot for her. Sadly, the very telegram Pansy came around to deliver that next morning was confirmation that all the arrangements had been made for her trip. So she was going to be able to go in the end and she never knew. Richard also said that Mary hadn't eaten any dinner in her depression and she'd taken two Secondal tablets with plans to take two more before bed. Now Secondal is a barbiturate that at this time was commonly used to treat insomnia. It was a sleeping pill that was widely abused and as a result it was eventually pulled from the market. So we're talking a very, very strong drug that Mary may have taken four of that evening. If a fire started when she was passed out from these drugs, there's a very strong chance that she might not have woken up. Small silver lining, I guess, is that she wouldn't have felt anything, it wouldn't have necessarily been painful, but it's not a very nice way to go. With the evidence of the electric clock stopping at 4.20, presumed to be AM, and Pansy waking up at 5 AM smelling smoke, it's thought that Mary died at some point between 4 and 5 AM that morning on the 2nd of July, but this has never been confirmed, it's kind of speculation at best. We don't know whether the fire burned hot and rapidly or if it slowly smouldered all night. She might have died a lot later or a lot earlier. So you're investigating a fire, the first thing you do is look for the source, how it started. The special report into this case notes that the first person into the apartment, whose name is redacted but from context clues I think it was the authorities, saw very little flames but lots of smoke. So this fire was still going slightly after 8am. This was potentially hours after it started and after that point it was quickly put out by a hand pump when the fire chief arrived. Investigation found that the heater in the living room appeared to be in very good shape and it was turned off at the time of the fire, so it couldn't have been that. 
The kitchen equipment, so a fridge, a three burner stove and tabletop water heater were all also in good shape and showed no signs of any electrical shorts. Two candles that were in the dining area had melted, but they weren't the cause of the fire, they weren't lit at the time. There was no indication of any short in any outlet near Mary's chair, there was no sign of any prior damage in the wires, no damage of any kind to the fuse box, or any signs of high voltage or amperage overload. None of the switches in the house seemed to be damaged. There was no obvious explanation as to what had caused this fire to start. It was noted that whilst the vast majority of Mary's furniture remained in the apartment, an overstuffed easy chair, an end table and lamp were all missing, and these were all where Mary was sitting at the time of the fire. All that remained were two small pieces of the table legs, which were said to be barely scorched, and chair springs. The lamp was wooden so it had burned in the fire, and the lampshade was destroyed, but according to the report the lamp bulb would still burn, which I assume means still turn on, and the hard rubber switch was also not damaged. Still, there was no obvious cause of the fire, but it was noted that Mary was partial to a cigarette on occasion, and a lighter was found in her bag. Is it possible that she had lit a cigarette and fallen asleep, which started the fire? Potentially that was and is their leading theory, but that didn't explain how the fire remained so contained just to Mary's body, or how it reached the extreme heat that it had to have done to essentially cremate the majority of her body. Obviously, I did a bit of research into this, and according to cremationassociation.org, the cremation process usually occurs between 1400 and 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 760 to 870 degrees Celsius, but this number does vary from state to state and country to country. That's essentially though how hot it has to be to reduce a human body to ash. And most standard house fires don't really reach that heat, although it does entirely depend on things like the fuel source and oxygen content. The cremation process generally takes anywhere from 3 to 4 hours, and if we're following the timeline here from approximately 4.30 when the fire might have started to 8am when the authorities were called, that is technically long enough to cremate a human body. However, something I didn't know going into this is that cremation doesn't completely break down the bones. It's really, really difficult to burn human bones down to ash, and that requires temperatures of 1,100 Celsius and above. That is hotter than the majority of house fires will ever get. And Mary's bones had been cremated, so whatever this fire was, it was really, really hot. At the time of her death, or at least when her son left her the night before, Mary was wearing a black rayon acetate nightgown. Now pulling from my A-level textiles knowledge here, rayon acetate is quite similar to cotton, and it's just as flammable. In fact, in a lot of places, rayon is banned for use in work clothing for these health and safety reasons. Investigation also showed that Mary's house coat, or her kind of dressing gown, was missing as well, with the obvious explanation being that she was wearing it at the time her body burned. The house coat was also said to be made from rayon and therefore, once again, highly flammable. The fibres that remained of both these items of clothing were sent to an FBI lab for analysis and they found no fluids, substances or chemicals that might have been used as an accelerant in this case. Neither herself nor anybody else had doused Mary's body in petrol, for example, before setting on fire. There was no accelerant there. Which brings us on to the FBI's official version of events in this case, their official theory. They theorised that Mary had taken a considerable amount of sedatives that evening, and while sitting in her armchair, which is described as overstuffed, she may have fallen asleep while smoking a cigarette. She accidentally lit herself on fire, her clothes easily igniting, and it would have been a pretty immediate death. They write that naturally the chair, the overstuffed chair, would have also set alight, creating an intense heat that completely destroyed both it and the end table next to it. Once Mary's body became ignited, it's said that Mary's own fatty tissues became the fuel that caused the fire to spread over her whole body. She is described in newspaper articles as being a heavy woman, 5 foot 7 and 170 pounds, so she would have had a lot of fatty tissues. The testing of the greasy substance on the unburnt rug was found to be melted human fat, which is just a lovely thing to visualise. It's speculated that the reason Mary's foot was all that was left of her is that the body simply ran out of fuel, the foot and ankle aren't particularly fatty areas of the body. 
And this explanation is something called the wick effect, with the human body acting like a kind of inside out candle. As we know, a candle is composed of a wick on the inside surrounded by wax made of flammable fatty acids. The wax ignites the wick and keeps it burning. In the human body, the fat is the flammable substance and your clothing and hair act as a wick. Boom, you have fire. So that's the official explanation, and I don't think many people argue the fact that it was likely Mary's own fatty tissue that provided fuel for the fire. What people do argue though is the cause, how it started. The FBI's theory that she fell asleep with a lit cigarette is purely speculation. It makes sense, but there's no actual proof of it. And that's where people's imaginations tend to run wild, along with why this fire remained so contained as well, that has been a huge point of contention. Which I suppose brings us onto the theory of spontaneous human combustion. The idea of spontaneous human combustion is the concept of a living or deceased human body combusting, setting alight, without any apparent external source of ignition. It's a pseudo-scientific concept, which is a statement, belief or practice that claims to be both scientific and factual, but is incompatible with the scientific methods. There's no actual basis in the idea of spontaneous human combustion, but just as it's never been proven, it's also never been disproven. Regardless, it's an idea that's mentioned a lot in pop culture, it's an idea that has appeared in literature and media repeatedly over the years, with Charles Dickens as far back as 1850 using it to kill off a character in Bleak House, using alcohol as the explanation, which for many years was a common line of thought as to spontaneous human combustion. Spontaneous human combustion and quicksand for some reason are two things that took up a lot of my worries as a child. I thought they'd be a lot more prevalent in my life than they are. The idea is that without external ignition, the fire starts within the body itself as the result of a chemical reaction. Now, of course, it's never been able to be proven. Nobody quite knows what this alleged reaction is or what causes it. One widespread theory is that the fire within starts when methane builds up in the intestines and it's ignited by enzymes, which in theory could happen, but in reality, who knows, probably not. Other theories say that the fire begins because of static electricity building up inside the body, and a self-proclaimed expert on this phenomenon says that it's caused by a new subatomic particle called pyroton, which interacts with cells to create a mini explosion but there's no actual scientific evidence to suggest that pyroton exists. The idea of spontaneous human combustion is something that scientists view with scepticism. However, it is a well-known fact that objects can spontaneously burst into flames without a heat source. A pile of oily rags stored together in an open container can ignite once subjected to oxygen. Wet piles of hay or straw have also been proven to ignite thanks to microbes or bacteria inside once it starts to decompose. In theory, it's possible, it's just not proven to happen in humans. But Mary Reese's case isn't alone. There's evidence as far back as 1663, starting with Danish anatomist Thomas Bartholin. He penned the first account of spontaneous human combustion about a woman in Paris who apparently went up in ashes and smoke while she was sleeping, but the straw mattress she slept on remained completely undamaged. A decade later, a French man published a whole collection of spontaneous human combustion cases. In 1902, in Norfolk, here in the UK, a woman called Sarah Morley's remains were found in her bedroom. She had been burnt to ashes, but the furniture around her remained untouched. In 1996, 92-year-old Dr. J. Irvin Bentley was discovered burnt to ashes in his home in Pennsylvania. All that was left of him was a leg and a foot. Once again, the furniture around him was untouched, but there was a hole in his vinyl floor and damaged the wooden beams below. In many of these cases, the people who found these scenes would report there being a very sweet, smoky smell, completely unlike the smell of normal smoke. A big question I had throughout researching this, and I'm sure you have too, is how is it possible, whether human combustion or not, that the fires remained so contained? This fire must have burned at 1100 Celsius plus for many hours for the bones to be broken down to ash. How in that time with that heat did it not spread, did it not cause more damage? Why were the only other victims of this fire the armchair and the side table? 
It seems like a very weak explanation to me and I don't know if I've just completely missed something in my research, but apparently once the fuel in the form of this fatty tissue runs out, the fire just dies. But why would the fire not just catch to other items in the vicinity? If that's the case, why do house fires even exist and destroy entire buildings? How does the fire not jump from one thing to another? Why does it not in this case, but does in some cases? I really feel like I'm missing something here because it's not really explained in any of the FBI reports. So if anybody does want to shed any light on this in the comments, please feel free. Somebody who's much more scientifically minded than me. Could it really just be that the flames burned hot and fast before just burning themselves out? And if the fire in Mary's case was just caused by a lit cigarette, how is it possible for this fire to have reached the heat needed to cremate her bones? Was it really just thanks to the flammable rayon nightgown? Fire expert Dr. Wilton M. Krogman, a professor of physical anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania has said, I cannot conceive of such complete cremation without more burning of the apartment. And then referencing the earlier possibility of Mary's skull being found, he said, the opposite has always been true. The skulls have exploded into hundreds of pieces or have been abnormally swollen. They don't shrink. I feel like the FBI's official explanation in this case answers a lot of the questions. And at face value, yes, this totally makes sense. But there are still so many unanswered questions that just don't quite make sense. Things that they don't cover in their explanation. One newspaper article about this case entitled The Strange Case of the Cinder Lady raises even more questions that I hadn't thought of. The smell. I said before that people reported a sweet smoky smell, but the burning of human flesh is said to be a horrific, acrid scent. I mean, we've all accidentally burnt the hairs on our fingers trying to light a candle, we've accidentally leant over the gas hob for too long with long hair, and the smell of burning hair is a terrible one, let alone flesh. I don't see any world in which that kind of scent could be described as sweet. The article also brings up that the human body is mostly water, so how does that work in terms of a whole body burning itself up? But the FBI simply says this is uncommon, but it's entirely possible. I could spend time here dipping my toe into some crazy theories, there's talk of murder and people throwing accelerant and ignition at Mary through an open window or an open door, they set her alight on purpose before putting out the flames and then setting the scene. This is all around unlikely, Mary was 60 something years old, she had no enemies, she kept to herself, there were no motives for this. And why would this be the way that you choose to murder somebody, like why would you go to that extent? Plus the fact that no accelerant was found at the scene, it's just highly unlikely if you ask me. Others talk about her being hit by a lightning strike which burned up her body from the inside out. However, I'm not sure how possible it is for Mary to be hit by a lightning strike in her own home, with the home showing no signs of damage on the outside. Others expanded on this and said the lightning struck her house and travelled through the outlets in her home, but the outlets were found to be fine and relatively undamaged. One letter in the official documents, which were sent from an anonymous person to the FBI, states the possibility of certain diseases being able to raise the temperature of the human body. We all know that some diseases can do that. However, this anonymous person theorises that some diseases could send the temperature up to unbelievable heights and a chemical reaction happens and ignites a fire within the body. Not sure how much basis that one has in reality, but if spontaneous human combustion is real, it's got to happen somehow. Maybe this is it, maybe it's just very, very rare. All in all, I don't have the answers in this case, and nor does anyone else, but it's calming to know that Mary likely wouldn't have been aware of what was happening. If she was on some of those very, very strong sleeping pills, she likely wouldn't have felt or even noticed the fire start, whether internally or externally. I'm very intrigued to hear your guys' opinions on the comments in this one. Do you think spontaneous human combustion really exists? Do you think a cigarette could have caused a fire like this? Please write in the comments, let me know.